aquatic ecology concerns uh, when we think about landscaping uh, on the, uh, in the context of, of residential sites. And um, what I hope to do today is kind of put this in the context of probably one of the reasons I was invited here was uh, we just finished off what I think is a, a real exciting project uh, called Landscaping at the Water's Edge, an ecological approach. Uh, and it's a, a training program for, um, it was developed as a training program for landscapers in New Hampshire, but uh, it's become very popular uh, as an information tool, an outreach tool for homeowners. Uh, so I'm going to briefly describe uh, this project and program that I was uh, uh, one of the large team that put together, and then kind of review some of these water quality and ecological issues that, that we face, particularly at the, at the shoreland areas, uh, and maybe make an argument that we really need to consider things slightly differently when we are dealing with shoreland areas. And then uh, give you uh, some of the recommendations that came out of this working group of uh, horticulturists, uh, turf, people, IPM people, uh, and uh, county educators uh, as we work through this project and argued about uh, what we really need to emphasize in terms of uh, concepts of landscape design and management approaches, uh, considering the importance. So again, as I said, the, um, the, the project is, is based on landscaping the water's edge and ecological approach, and uh, I didn't get a chance to a lot of them, but we do have a few copies of the actual uh, core manual that was produced. For the landscapers training, we actually uh, provide a very large notebook, which since we had carry-on luggage, we didn't get a chance to bring. Uh, and it's a two-day program designed uh, to cover and have field exercises as, as well as working design exercises uh, for uh, landscapers in and around the state. And there's been quite an interest uh, in uh, in this by the landscapers, and as I said, uh, besides just the, the homeowner interest that we have. We're talking about um, shorelands of all different types, be they lakes and ponds or rivers or even wetland areas. And the whole idea of what we're trying to do here, and, and I was president of the North North Lake Management Society, and I actually saw uh, big displays for state lake associations, and they have pictures like this up here. I think this originated out of Washington State, and uh, they uh, picked it up in Ohio and, uh, and used it a lot. And, and I think landscaping gets the bum rap in a lot of cases, because I really don't think that landscaping has to be the problem, but that's a perception, I think, that we, that we have to deal with. What we really would like to do is change that approach and actually make landscaping the solution. The whole philosophy of this exercise that, that we work in the training is that you can actually use landscaping to provide better water quality protection so the water coming off of your property can actually better than how it, how it is coming onto the property. So turning this whole thing around and using what we know and understand of the benefits of vegetation on the landscape in, in residential areas to actually correct a lot of the problems that we cause when we develop in residential areas. So if we go through, and I'm not going to go into big detail about what's there, but if we take a look at what's actually in the, in the training program in the manual, uh, we have uh, the expected overview, of course, of, of why we're doing what we're doing and what our concerns are. Um, we have a, a, a two different types of evaluations that we do training for. The first one is really taking a look at the drainage situations on site, the chapter that I developed, uh, along with a, a kind of a following the flow type of concept, uh, where we really take a look at where all the different types of water sources and, and where the fate of water, um, what happens on the landscape, and then strategies for, for dealing in, in both vegetative ways and, and engineering and structural ways uh, for, for minimizing the problem that we have with runoff. Uh, a big section on vegetative buffers. And then the other, the other section that, that's kind of the design section is this whole idea of uh, the design process. We have put together 10 principles and an inventory method to really take a look at the site, really think about what you really want to do on the site, 
uh, and then fit all of that into then your decision making of your site design, your plant selection, and things like that. Uh, we also give information about actually planting different types of um, vegetative material on, on and around the property. Uh, we have a full section on lawn care put together by our uh, turf specialists at UNH and um, uh, a, whole, a whole slew of appendices because as you realize, besides what might be the uh, right or objective thing to do, there are also regulations that the various states have when you're dealing with uh, shoreland properties and uh, ad ad additional resources as well as a recommended plant list. So it's, it's not hard to justify what we do, what we do, but in New Hampshire, I don't know, have you ever seen what our license plates look like? Anyone you know what it says on our license plates? It says, live free or die. I always say it means live free and die, but um, it's very hard to get a law passed. And so we've gone out of our way to really talk about the benefits of of clean water uh, in our state where tourism really is number two in terms of industry. Uh, back in 2002, the New Hampshire Lakes Association conducted a study that showed that just five uses of water, those five uses that you see there, generated back then about 1. billion annually to the state's economy. Uh, and right now it's over 2 billion uh, and about 15,000 jobs or more. Just with those five different aspects. It doesn't really cover everything, but just to give you some idea of the importance of, of clean water in the state. And bringing it down to the homeowner, uh, from, I coordinate a, a long-term volunteer lake mine, monitoring program, and uh, using the data that we provided to our resource economics team at UNH, they actually showed that depending upon the market we were in, a three-foot loss in water cloudy could generate somewhere between a 10 and 20 percent loss in property value. Now, that becomes important to the homeowner because it's their, their value. It becomes important in New Hampshire to the town and community because we don't have an income tax. We have property taxes. And it becomes important even to the person that lives off the lake because if we take a look at the analyses, the property taxpayers on the shorelands are paying, in some towns, over 90% of the tax burden for towns. So if you decrease that, um, that worth or value of the on the shorelands, the off-lake, the off-river, the offshore people essentially start having higher taxes to be paid. So there's, there's an economic interest for everyone in this. And as is probably being kicked around a lot. We know that when we go from a forested landscape, which was what was the original, we have the paleontological record that shows when we go deep down into the cores, that when our lakes had, were in their best conditions in northern New England and, and across the country after glaciation, they were, they were forested. Uh, and, and we expect a certain amount of runoff anyway in, in the natural condition, as well as nutrient loading and sediment loading. When we change that um, condition and put in uh, a change on the landscape, we get changes that occur uh, that, are, that are multipliers in terms of uh, the impacts that, that can happen going from that undisturbed landscape to uh, the residential developed landscape. And if this is the case that occurs on a single property on the shore, uh, and I stole this from Jim Gibbons out of Yukon, and it's just extremely elegant way of showing what's going on, we're taking and creating these islands where we're modifying and growing different things than we've ever before. And more importantly, we're creating these conduits to bring down those materials that are uh, being generated. I think Roger Bannerman has showed that uh, in, at, in Wisconsin studies that, that there's a tremendous amount of, of additional runoff and concentration of runoff and higher loadings occurring because not only do we do what we do, but we provide the transport routes for that runoff that occurs. And it all has to do, as we all remember, that the the water table is being, the, the water cycle is essentially being impacted uh, by what we're doing on the landscape. That drop of those billions and billions of drops of rainwater, when we hit these unexposed areas that we've changed from being vegetated, are uh, creating the opportunity for both erosion, material movement, and transport. And luckily, in New Hampshire, we're still somewhere around the 89 or so percent forest cover. 
Uh, but when we go from fast cover to the changes that we see, that's when we have our concerns. And, and it's, it's not just what we do in terms of what we grow or choose to grow. Again, it's the importance of the previous surface uh, that we're creating the conduits that we're creating, the interceptors which take then this high-velocity water which can carry 